So this evening in our marketing kind, we're going to be uh, exploring what happens when your ethical practices in a social enterprise are so exciting that people reach out to you and want to learn how to replicate those ethical practices to the degree that that creates a whole new business model for your social enterprise. I think it was our November exchange with David Boynton, the outgoing global CEO of The Body Shop, who said that one of the coolest things he ever did at The Body Shop was to reach out to today's guest, Joe and Greyston Bakery, to understand their model of open hiring and work with them in applying it to The Body Shop. And that ultimately led to 5,000 job opportunities in retail for people who'd previously been completely excluded from the labour market. Now, as it happens, Joe himself was in attendance at that exchange. Um, and when we heard the story, we knew that we had to share that idea across marketing kind um, and to do so by listening to the man himself. Um, Joe and Grayson have got some really ambitious goals for the future. And when I say really ambitious, I do mean it. They want to change how we understand employment. They want to create 40,000 um, breakthrough jobs through open hiring um, and achieve uh, $3 billion of social impact by 2030. Um, as this is a Your Marketing Kind, a couple of more CV type um, uh, details. So Joe started his career on Wall Street. Um, he's also uh, experienced corporate America with PepsiCo. Um, he left that to join local government and became an expert in social services. Um, I think we need more people who span multiple um, sectors in their experience. Um, and then, of course, um, joined Greyston Bakery, uh, where he ultimately has become um, CEO and president. Um, and he also extends his impact um, with various advisory roles. Um, as do many of us, although these are particularly exciting ones, including being on the BT that we, if we don't already know what it is, may hear a little more about at some point today, um, and is also on the board of Conscious Capitalism. So welcome to Marketing Kind for the second time, Jay. Well, well thank you, Paul and Anna. And before I get started, I, I would like to know just how many people prior to today, I guess, had heard about Grayston or know something about Grayston seeing some shaking heads which is what i'd normally get <laughs> uh you don't count paul and anna <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh let me just give just a quick overview of myself you kind of talked about it a little bit uh paul but uh yeah my career spans a few different uh, industries different sectors i actually started as an insurance underwriter um, at chubb and son uh, right out of college so, so underwriting insurance for financial institutions before going to lehman brothers now defunct former investment bank um, on Wall Street. I left in 2001. I like to tell people not 2008, uh, so I had nothing to do with the eventual collapse. Uh, then spent some time in uh, at PepsiCo, as you mentioned, in different roles, uh, sales strategy, pricing, uh, capital markets, risk management uh, before, and that was about 10 years with Pepsi, almost 10 years. Uh, then went into government, both elected office as well as appointed office with my last role uh, being the deputy commissioner for social services for our county here in New York. Um, in the states, the states are divided into different counties, and each county has their own county executive. So think of the mayor of the county, if you will. Um, I was a deputy commissioner for the social safety net that provides all of the support to those who are low income, unemployed, so on and so forth. And that's how I got connected to this place called Grayston. Um, oddly enough, part of my portfolio in social services included employment. So I worked with a lot of folks who were trying to get trained, trying to find jobs so that they could get off public assistance and get into the economic mainstream. And I had never heard of Grayston. Um, and here I am with a portfolio spanning the entire county and never heard of Grayston and what Grayston did and just how impactful it could be to the people that we served at that time. And so when you look at my career, you'll see that I've been on kind of a, a purpose journey, if you will, just trying to find my place in, in the, the world. Uh, I'm, I love business. I still love it to this day, uh, but I wanted something more than growing revenue, growing EBITDA, <laughs> increasing our, our, our business. Mm. 
and if we could, I don't know if we can mute. To, here we go. Uh, but I wanted something more from uh, what I did and how I could contribute to society and really found a home here at Grayston. Uh, many people, if you know Grayston at all, you probably know us from the products that we're in, not so much from the name or even our crown jewel, which I'll get into in a little bit. But um, as I usually like to start, you know, can tell people, you know, if you had a pint of Ben and Jerry's chocolate fudge brownie or a mint chocolate chance, or if you had, we have Whole Foods here in the U.S. Um, it's a vegan birthday cake blondie ice cream, which is very good if you can get your hands on it. Uh, where are the brownies that are in those products? Um, if you go to the Whole Foods supermarket here in the U.S., um, there it's packaged brownies that you might see at the end caps or in the aisles. Where are those brownies um, that, that are produced here, which is where I sit in Yonkers, New York? Um, just so you understand the entity itself, we're what you would call a hybrid social enterprise. So what that means is we have a for-profit bakery, which is Grayston Bakery. It's a benefit corporation here in the U.S. And what that means is we are governed by the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit in that order. We are certified by outside a nonprofit called B-Lab, which basically means we rise to the highest standards of transparency, people's planet, you know, uh, and social governance. Um, we are, when they used to do this, we were the, their top uh, benefit corporation in the world. So we were uh, in the top 5% of the benefit corporations that are out there. And I believe there's probably five or 6,000 now worldwide uh, benefit corporations that are out there, including our friends like uh, Ben and Jerry's Unilever or uh, the body shop that was mentioned earlier. So we're very proud of that. But the the benefit corporations, Grayston Bakery, is owned by Grayston Foundation, which is the nonprofit, which is where I sit. And I'm, I'm in the office now at the nonprofit. And I can get into the history of the nonprofit. We did a lot of different things when we were originally founded, but now our focus is on our open hiring model at the bakery and seeing that implemented in different contexts. But we also train a lot of folks. Um, if you look at both entities, uh, we train folks who have one or more barriers to employment. So think barriers broadly. So formerly incarcerated, refugee, English as a second language, homeless, people on public assistance, name it, they have probably been through our foundation or the bakery at one point in time. And it goes back to our founding 42 years ago um, by this man named Bernie Glassman, who was an interesting character, uh, a Jewish guy from Brooklyn, New York City who was trained as an aeronautical engineer that then became a Zen Buddhist monk that then became this great social entrepreneur. And if I did a PowerPoint slide, you'd see this picture of him and this Zen Buddhist community outside this beautiful mansion in Riverdale section of uh, Bronx, New York, called the Grayston Mansion, which is where we got our name. And this community would support themselves baking cakes and tarts for high-end restaurants in New York City in 1982 in the 80s. Um, and it was then that Bernie, uh, really driven by his beliefs, uh, saw that and think of our economy at that time in the 80s, it was not doing very well in terms of homelessness, AIDS, and things like that. And Bernie would see in this section of uh, the Bronx and pretty much close to where we are here in Yonkers that uh, many were unemployed, uh, but many were unemployed but wanted to work but couldn't. Uh, because they had one or more of these barriers to employment. Um, AIDS at that time was, you know, unknown. People didn't know what it meant or how you could contract it. So people couldn't get jobs. They couldn't get housing. And Bernie felt that, you know, it's his mission um, to leverage what they were doing at um, in Grayston Mansion to leverage their business of baking cakes and tarts and show people another way uh, to give them a skill, to give them a trade that they could either use with this group of Zen Buddhists or take it somewhere else and get a job elsewhere. But Bernie really saw that business could be a force for good, not just producing a product or a service, but that it could also change a life. And really at the end, what Bernie really wanted to do, it really wasn't about cakes and tarts, and the brownies did not come until later, until the mid to late 80s, but it was really about how do you give people hope, and how do you give people hope uh, beginning with just one job. So that's what started what we now call open hiring. Um, if you just, I wish I could just imagine Bernie doing this, but he would literally pull people off the streets and just say, you know, do you want to 
do you want to work? Do you want to learn something new? Do you want to learn this skill? And he would bring folks into this bakery and show them how it's done. Um, and essentially, that's what we do to this day. Um, open hiring is just that, uh, a no questions form of hiring, uh, where folks now used to have to come to our physical location on 104 Alexander Street in Yonkers and put your name on what we would call a job list. Now you could do it online and you just go to graceton.org backslash open hiring jobs and add your name to the list, which is about I think 700 people now. Uh, but that's all it entailed, your name, contact information, how we can reach you, um, and as we call people in, when we would call people in, uh, maybe 10 at a time or so, um, if you got the call, you got the job um, automatically. No questions asked. You know, we don't do the background checks. We don't do interviews. We'll teach you. That's all part of the apprenticeship, what we call the apprenticeship process here. Um, there's an orientation day where you come in, you bring two forms of ID, you get introduced to the organization. We talk about your benefits, introduce you to the culture. Um, and then you get brought onto the floor and what we hope uh, will be a, you know, six to nine months, depending on your progress apprenticeship. And after that, you graduate to what we call a line worker, access to a union. And what I believe and really it's since I became CEO and I've been with Grace to now a total of six years, uh, four as the CEO, I began as the VP of programs here at the foundation. But um, what I hope is a, an opportunity for you to move up within the organization or move out uh, through our foundation where we can train you in other industries and we do everything soup to nuts you know hard skills training and certification in other industries the wraparound support that you need and the job placement service to place you elsewhere but the idea is to take these folks and many of these folks have dropped out of society because they've been told no so many times they've just given up looking for work and either they make do through other means whether it's legal or otherwise but uh, or they just stay on public assistance or they recidivate and go back into the criminal justice system and we and I continue to feel the same way as Bernie did. It's an injustice when you have folks that want to work, that are willing to work, <laughs> ready to do it, and the opportunities just aren't afforded to them because of their past, because of our what we would say are antiquated policies when it comes to hiring, when it even comes to where you look to hire people. Um, we just have to have a mind shift and some bold and courageous thinking uh, in terms of how we can change that whole paradigm um, and really develop a new way of looking at the future of work and who we who we can employ and who is actually able to work. Uh, so that's been one of the key goals of our foundation um, these last few years um, is to really export the model um, and to share it with others. Um, the more industries and in different places and different uh, contexts, the better, because it shows that the model can be replicated. And it shows that um, you can bring folks in and they will do a good job. And we've seen this now with, the, and we talked about the body shop earlier, um, even though they're going through their current challenges, and I'm sure we can talk about that later. But in 2018, 2019, they decided to pilot this idea uh, because, and as most of the folks who come to us do, they could not get help uh, for their distribution centers. It was it was a challenge to get people, but also to keep people. And that's any business's challenge. And obviously that impacts ROI. Um, over the long term. Uh, but uh, they started in 2018 with a distribution center in North Carolina, about 300 jobs, I would say. And um, within the year, they saw the you know, productivity as well as retention um, improving double digits. Uh, productivity was up 13% the initial run. Um, they cut their the turnover rate, turnover meaning how many people left the organization, um, that was cut by almost two thirds because people were staying, um, which we know to be true because when you think of the populations that are going through this, they reward you with their loyalty because uh, where everyone else would tell them no, you know, your organization is saying yes. So given the success of that, you know, Body Shop decided to roll it out to other uh, parts of their footprint. Uh, so from North Carolina. It went to the U.S. distribution centers, eventually went to Canada, then they spread to distribution and retail. <laughs> uh, and that grew from U.S., Canada to Australia and the U.K. And um, update on that, Paul, you know, as of last year, end of last year, 6,500 opportunities were provided. Um, 
And if you look at the data, and to me, the data doesn't lie, and hopefully we can tell this to our friends at Aurelius, that, you know, the pipeline of the folks that were coming through at the body shop, when you look at ethnicity, when you look at gender, when you look at age, so diverse. And I would say, you know, that's your entry level point. And so these are your future managers or your future coordinators, whatever it might be. When you look at trust and engagement and the body shop, has, they've been doing this um, survey, doing these surveys ever since they started doing open hiring, the open hires had a greater level of trust and engagement than everyone else. <laughs> So the trust was there, the engagement was there, the diversity piece of it was there. Um, everything that you would want and, and the, the, both the productivity as well as the retention continued throughout. I mean, they were able to improve and they brought a lot of people in through their uh, temporary, but their conversion rate from temporary to permanent almost doubled um, during that time. So all of that retention, engagement, diversity, everything that you could possibly think of. And there's an ESG argument there too, because the people that you're bringing in um, were having half of the uh, folks that were brought in through the body shops, uh, open hiring, they call it inclusive hiring, by the way, half of those folks were not working when they were brought in. And we can attest to that too, about almost 25% of the folks that we bring in at the bakery through open hiring, they'd been out of work for almost a year. So just think about being out of work for a year and what that could do to you and your family. Um, so the impact of this is huge. You think about the salary that gets generated from someone who's hired through your organization. The diversion, um, probably 20 to 30% of our folks have some type of a criminal justice involvement. Um, and we know from studies, whether it's Brookings, whether it's AEI, you know, the White House Economic Council of Economic Advisors, if you can't get a job after you've gotten out of prison or some type of a jail within the that's 30 to 60 days, you're going back. The, the odds of you going back are very high. So the fact that these folks can get jobs and get into the workplace and hopefully get, you know, begin a trajectory that's great for them and positive for them within your organization, all of that is economic impact. Um, getting folks off public assistance, that's an impact. Now government can die can uh, allocate those resources to the folks that really need it. Um, I mentioned the costs that are involved in the criminal justice system, and but also just the income and the economic multiplier of folks working as opposed to being on public assistance and now contributing to the economy. All of that is great. And PS, you know, we're located in Southwest Yonkers, which is probably an economically depressed area of Yonkers. Yonkers is pretty much like the United States. There's a very wealthy portion. There's a very middle-class portion and there's also a, a portion where you know there's a high level of poverty a high level of dropouts uh, folks that are coming out of the criminal justice system are coming here uh, about 40 percent of the social services cases come from yonkers alone so we have an impact that we can have here but we're small the bakery is very small um the about 100 employees um, maybe 50 of those employees are what we would call the open hires so we believed years ago and until this day, we need more companies to do what we're doing to have that greater impact. Because if you look at the studies, probably 10 million or so folks, um, and they can be higher depending on what study you look at, but 10 million of, of the folks have dropped out of the labor force. So these are the folks that aren't measured in the unemployment rate. These are the folks who've just totally given up. Um, they get brought in through efforts and innovations like this. So it's, for me, it's, it's very exciting. A very exciting time for uh, for us as an organization, but I think as a country and really as a world to really rethink labor, rethink how we look at it, and to really understand and really appreciate the impact that you can have by just running your own business, whatever it might be. Uh, I mentioned Body Shop, but we have smaller organizations like a, a janitorial services company in Rochester, New York, that employs 10 people. Uh, Rhino Foods, that makes the cookie dough that goes into the Ben & Jerry's ice cream. There are about 200 employees up in Vermont. Uh, we've just started working with um, IKEA um, to launch open hiring from one of their distribution centers on the East Coast. So it's broad, uh, but you know we do need more. But I know it takes time. And coming from a corporate 
background. I understand that you have to go through your general counsel and your CHRO and you got to socialize it with your the frontline managers and tell them why we're changing from this to another. Uh, that all takes time. And that's, you know, that's one of the, I don't want to say it's one of the downsides, but it is one of the challenges that you face in what I totally admit and agree is a radically different way of looking at hiring, um, particularly if you're classically trained to interview and to do the background checks and to understand that. But really for a job where you can learn the job on the job that's entry level, do we really care what someone's background is? And can we provide the support that's needed to make sure that they are successful? So taking the time and the resources that get invested to keeping people out, how do we kind of reinvest that to keep people in? And one of the ways we do it at the bakery and here at the foundation as well is we have a social worker, if you will, a resource support specialist on staff that works with our bakers, but really works with anyone um, that's dealing with housing, transportation, whatever it might be, substance abuse, anger management, child care, child support, whatever it might be that supports our employees. Um, and the whole idea is to make sure that um, you're not in crisis, because if you're in crisis, you're not showing up for work or you're not as productive um, if you show up at all. So uh, we want to make sure that we provide those supports to our, our employees. And for me, <clears throat> to me, that's just another employee benefit. That's just smart HR. What can we do to support our employees? And, you know, when I became CEO in April 2020, one of the things that we learned coming out of COVID was, you know, how can we better support our employees, right? How can we make sure that they feel safe? How can we make sure that they understand that there is a career path for them at whatever stage they're in in their career? I mean, all these things are just smart HR practices. So you know, that's pretty much the story of Grayston. Uh, in a sense, you've got a different model with Grayston in that usually somebody, you know, there's a phrase, well begun is half done. And uh, usually when somebody applies for a job, they have to prove themselves to the employer. And then they start work with that sense of something to live up to. Um, and there are many ways in which I think that model might be broken, actually. But some of that is relevant today and some isn't. Now, you've got a different model at Greyston where the first thing that happens is you give somebody a chance and they, you talked about the loyalty that, that accrues from that. People feel a sense of loyalty because you have. Now, part of that is because you've taken a risk because Greyston is a massively successful social enterprise, but it's still vulnerable. It's it's a human scale operation. So when you take some <coughs> off, take somebody on, you're you're giving something, not from, you know, not something that is easy to give. And I kind of want to understand a little bit scale because, you know, let's say there was government assistance and any business could do this. That sense of loyalty might not be there because then you've just given somebody a job because that's what you're subsidized to do and, and so on. So, and there's also a certain sort of group of people for whom this is particularly relevant um, because at the moment, the system that's available to them is letting them down. Yeah. So what... What is the sort of right way to go about scale? How far could this go? I know you've got some really exciting ambition in terms of impact, but realistically nurturing this at what kind of upper scale can it get to and how? Yeah, and, and funny that I want to touch on, you mentioned the term risk and you have risk even when we go through the traditional hiring practice and I can attest to it, you know, you know, the number of interviews that we go through here and the number of people that you talk to here and still doesn't work out. <laughs> so um, I would say our system is built on a system of trust, uh, just given the nature of the job and we will show you how to do it and we'll train you and teach you um, but it's really up to you to be successful for me the scale is really going to be driven by the intentionality and i would say the dna of the organization um i and i blatantly i think i don't know which podcast or 
uh, video you may have watched of mine, but I say all the time, like, if this is something that folks are just doing to green or black or brown wash their organization, don't do open hiring um, because you, it's, it has to be intentional. Um, it has to be a part of your mission. It has to be a part of your DNA um, to really make this work. Um, but the scaling of it, and this is what I said, Paul, is one of the challenges behind this. It does take time because even with the mission-minded, purpose-driven companies like a body shop or the IKEA, yeah, it took five years to get to where we are with IKEA, uh, with uh, the body shop, and two years to get to where we are with IKEA. So just thinking about that, uh, scaling can happen, but it's you just have to have a broad view and you know, a long horizon in terms of uh, implementation, execution, and then kind of see the the fruits of your labor. So that's really the, the challenge with scale. But I would also say it's very, very important that the intentionality of the business and the DNA of the business has to be critical to that. And the buy-in from the management up and down the line has to be there for this to really work and to scale. I don't know if that answered your question. Um, and we might even come back a little bit, some further thoughts on scale, but let's go mm -hmm. to the, and then Nicole uh, and then Alan. Uh -huh. <laughs> The first observation I've got is there is an argument, of course, about cost savings because HR can put in the most complicated recruitment processes and you're just cutting through all of them. So that's just an observation. Second one is in the UK, we make right to work really complicated. <laughs> and if you haven't got it, then employers will be in big trouble. So presumably you've got something like that in the States. So if you haven't checked paperwork beforehand, you might be in a muddle. And the third third thing I've got is a really direct question. If you've got, uh, this comes from my work as a diversity consultant, it can be really hard to communicate benefits to people on the front line. Mm. So all the support that you're offering, recently I did a project with an engineering company, all the office staff used all the benefits available. The people actually out there doing the job didn't know anything about them because they're not online. So have you come, have you found a way of making sure that the people on the floor know everything that you offer and use it? Yeah. Yeah. So let me take the, the last question. So that's the whole piece behind the uh, resource and support specialist. And I'm going to touch on your cost question as well. Mm -hmm. I normally, I, I don't like to say, put it in the terms of savings, but it's really, I would say a cost reallocation of the mm -hmm. time and effort that's taken with mm -hmm. excluding people with the background checks and the interviews and things like that. And you take that and you invest it in things like the resource and support specialists. But those, that's one of the things, first things you learn during your, your two day orientation. We have a two day orientation when people get called in for the first time, we let you know that you have this resource for you and she can meet with you as much and as often as you like in terms of mapping out where you want to go, um, checking in on you and, you know, really seeing we, one of the things we've done in these last two years really is kind of pinpointing people to see um, who could be the next uh, R&D coordinator or the next supply chain coordinator. It seems like you've got these requisite skills that make you a candidate to be promoted. Um, so we've been very intentional about identifying folks and moving them into other other areas within the organization um, so that we can get to the next person on the list and kind of keep moving folks along and even helping people move out uh, and start their own businesses. Um, there's a CBS, which is one of the stations here, did a, a segment on one of our folks who started her own catering and uh, restaurant business um, in the city next door to us. And she's doing quite well. And she was supported by our supply chain and our R&D folks to help her get her business off the ground because we saw that as being a good thing. Um, and she was someone who went from a baker to a quality coordinator to owning our own business. Uh, so we make those um, offerings of, of the benefits available you're really your first day on the job and that's what gets communicated to you so that you really understand uh, what's available. Did I get to your Thanks. question, Teresa? Yeah. Yep, a perf perfect answer. I just don't know why I didn't think of it myself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Joe. This has been uh, fascinating so far. Um, I understand there are challenges to this, but I was wondering if you or anyone else you know uh, have used the open hiring concept for positions that are not entry level. 
because obviously we understand entry level uh there are, are a lot of benefits and, and ways yeah. of being but is there any chance that this could work at different levels higher levels uh, on the rung yeah and it, it's interesting and then here's where we start to get into some of the nomenclature that we've developed over time so open hiring is kind of that no questions asked form of hiring and then you know I say there's another level called inclusive hiring. So it may not be open hiring, but maybe we, we just get a bit more relaxed, if you will, in our standards, or we focus on different populations or specific populations as opposed to come one, come all. And I would say we've done that in a sort of in our other positions. I mentioned the woman who went from being a baker to going into R&D. It wasn't really open hiring, but we saw something in her and we said, you know what, we're going to move you into this position because you've demonstrated the requisite skills to be an R&D coordinator. We've, we've, we've done that with um, supply chain. We've done that with maintenance. So I would say it's not open hiring, but it is at an inclusive form where we're seeing a skill set being demonstrated that we could use at another level above where you are now. So yeah, not necessarily open hiring, but um, it is more inclusive and more open to, to kind of bringing folks into another career path outside of the entry level. Um, that's something that the body shop was looking at as well to see if they could do the same thing within their organization. But really for us, uh, it's just one, just to kind of improve the concept, get a proof of concept at the entry level and get the data at the entry level with different industries so that we can say, okay, now that we've kind of proven it here and going back to Teresa's question, about cost and about EDI, about ESG, and really show like, you know, we've got some robust data behind it. Let's take it to the next level, uh, but we're not there yet. I have two questions, if that's okay. Oh, please. <laughs> um, my first question is regarding, you know, the, the consequences of open hire in terms of performance management. Hmm. But by, you know, were, were there any implications and any consequences as a result of that and then the second question um we brought in a program at a former business i was running and it was actually to employ former prisoners people who've been in jail and what was interesting and surprising and honestly a wee bit disappointing was the amount of resistance there was from other people on the shop floor mm. and i was wondering whether you've seen anything like that as well and how did you manage mm -hmm. it yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, all these are good questions. I'm, I appreciate them. Um, and we get these a lot. I'll, I'll go to the performance management piece, because um, that is something um, there's some assumptions that are made about open hiring vis-a-vis -vis and performance management. And I, I tell people all the time that, you know, what we get rid of is the barrier to entry, but we don't get rid of professional standards and, con and code of conduct. Um, going back to who we provide product to Ben and Jerry's, Unilever, Whole Foods, you know, marquee companies that have high standards. We need high standards from a professional um, product standpoint as well. So we will part ways if you know folks are late or they don't show up and don't call out or they're wearing jewelry on the floor, which uh, obviously we don't want things falling into the the, the, cook, the dough or anything like that. So we will part ways. We have what we call a point system. And the idea is not to accumulate too many points. Um, and when you get to a certain point, you have a sit down with your manager and then if it keeps going, there's a write up. And if it keeps going, we talk about parting ways. So that's built into the system. And obviously, Alan, we try to make sure that um, we understand folks' situation because sometimes you might have folks who may not be as productive on the floor, but you later find out they're sleeping in their car. So how can we, again, leveraging the resource and support specialists, how can we help that person correct that situation? Uh, so we look for a reciprocal relationship. If you're struggling in some area, how can we work with you? But um, if that doesn't work, absolutely, um, we part ways because, uh, again, we have to get product out the door we have to make sure it's of the highest standards adhering to our goods manufacturing practices that's just what we do um, but uh, we eliminate barrier to entry but not professional standards and uh, codes of conduct so that's very important for us and yes the, to your second question obviously some folks have challenges or shall we say with certain 
populations and one of the our partners we work with that's doing I would say inclusive hiring uh, because they um, it's just part of their culture and it's just where they are from in terms of you know kind of finding a happy medium with uh, their management team they exclude sex offenders um, not because they're near a school or anything like that but just their management is just not there in terms of bringing that particular cohort into their organization and not knowing that that cohort is there so uh, they really I mean they have a very diverse workforce a lot of refugees from different countries but um, the one population that they do exclude is those who are sex offenders um, and then you have uh, folks who have challenges with you know the formerly incarcerated I get that question a lot as well uh, but some of the the best stories we have um, from our alums are those who have some type of, well, I would say, justice involvement. Uh, but at the end of the day, no matter what your background is or what what have you, it's not the past that we care about. But if you bring that same mentality to the current environment and the current workplace, and it's disruptive, or you're or you're just you know insubordinate, yeah, we will handle the situation um, and if we have to part ways we part ways but it is dealt with um but you know, that's part of really any environment where folks have challenges with personalities or, <laughs> or you know being in certain locations uh, it's just part of it but i understand that people have some of those issues but i thought it was sherm society of uh, human resources management i think they had done a survey that showed that many hr professionals are actually open to the formerly incarcerated being in their organizations. But what I also find that we need to do, and we've done this with folks, is you know just talking to them about what life is like. You know, our director of HR will talk with folks about how do we deal with certain situations, how it's not chaos and anarchy because we have open hiring. There's still guardrails uh, around professionalism. And it's just a conversation as opposed to just letting people kind of dwell on their misperceptions and misconceptions of what open hiring really is yeah the the, the issue we had wasn't from the directors or the hr community the, the oh. issues we had were actually other people on the shop floor yeah yep yeah, we've seen that too we've seen that too and again it, it's a matter of just having a sit down with them um because also it's a it's a loss of control uh we speak from a standpoint that we've always been open hiring so we never had to change uh so with some of these other organizations, that's where that mind shift comes in. It's like, wait, I'm not interviewing. I don't know who these people are. You're going to bring these folks in without me knowing who that that causes a lot of anxiety. And really, that's part of the orientation process is to really get folks grounded in what life is like here, you know, who your manager is going to be, what shift you're going to be on, what our standards are, um, so that folks truly understand what it means to work here and, and what support they have as managers. Um, and we saw this with Body Shop. I know if David was here, he'd talk about how they revamped their whole learning and development agenda and training for their supervisors so that their supervisors are equipped. But Again, wouldn't you just do that anyway to make sure that your managers are equipped to manage people? That's just something that happens. You just have this new element here that gets introduced to the the training. Um, but as long as they're trained, as long as they understand uh, from us, from our own HR, um, that you know there's support there if you need it. But there's also let us mitigate the concerns that you might have. Because even in manufacturing, like I said before, you can interview day and night and that doesn't work out either. <laughs> Hi Joseph. Um, How are you? Thank you for the uh, questions, folks. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing and congratulations on what you've achieved. I'm going to say so far, right? <laughs> obviously, much more to come. Um, I was just thinking about discovery uh, amongst your potential uh, potential hires. How do they find out about you? You know, what's the, what's the outreach? Yeah, there really is no outreach. Uh, we don't advertise per se that we have jobs opening a lot of it is really just word of mouth um it's not uncommon to have you know you know parent and child working here we've had um significant others working here together we've had people that lived in the same building um the outreach is really you know many of our local governments know about us so the city of yonkers knows about us the local nonprofits and other community-based organizations know about us uh department of corrections and department of probation youth bureaus they all know about us but it's all word of mouth you won't find an, an open hiring ad in any uh, uh 
social media or things like that. It's just really folks telling others about the job and what it's done for them and, and how it's helped them. So that's how people discover us. Uh, word of mouth is key. And same at the foundation about the programs we have here. Folks just tell other people. And um, then, like I said, we have a list that's 700 people, persons long. So it's, uh, we got a ways to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Just just a quick question. I mean, I love this idea about removing barriers to entry. Um, it's all, it all sounds phenomenal, but you know, something I've been I'm thinking of, especially when you when you give the opportunity and the patience to new hires, as well as the fact that you say you have seven hundred people on the list and it's not such a massive organization. Um, you know, some social enterprises will hire people or help people based on need. So, say you're someone who has. I don't know, come to this country or, or, or the US a refugee and has you know no employment prospects as so they go to the front of the queue but uh, what it sounds like to me I mean correct me if I'm wrong at, at Grayston it's just first come first serve um it, do you then run the risk of you know someone who could kind of do without maybe has some other um, people gaining income in their family or their household Whereas you have some people who literally have this is their only option and this is their only chance, but they end up being a hundred down in the queue because there really is no barriers to entry. Just out of out of curiosity about that. Mm -hmm. So how do we man kind of manage that? Is what you're asking? I just want to make sure I understand the question, Ronnie. Yeah, if if there is some sort of management, I mean, it would be fully understandable to say no. We just just first come first serve, and it is what it is. Yeah. And, and really, Ronnie, and it's a very good question. I haven't gotten that that particular question before, but yeah, that's basically what it is. It is first come, first serve. But when I say 700 people, remember, um, a lot of the folks on, on the list are rather transient or, you know, they have the temporary phones or they may have found another job. So even when we would call in, let's say 10 people at a time, you got to call 30 because uh, folks don't pick up or folks say they just, you know, I heard about it, but I really don't want to work at a bakery, which we get. I mean, one thing I did mention, it's a, this is a tough job. Uh, it's not for everybody. We have 12 hour shifts, you're standing, you're lifting bags, heavy bags of sugar and flour. It's rather monotonous. So it's not for everybody, but um, it takes a few calls and a few people to get through um, uh, an orientation. So we might get to that person, whoever they might be, but we don't pick and choose who's because that kind of defeats the whole purpose of open hiring. And P.S. We have had refugees work here, Afghan refugees, through one of the no local nonprofits that we work with. Amazing. Yeah, thanks. No, that it, it makes a lot of sense. And it's a wonderful way of doing things. Yeah. yeah thanks. And you mentioned in your opening comments about exporting the idea to other mm. businesses. How did that initially happen? How did it all start? You know, it actually started, I have to give credit to my predecessor, Mike Brady, when he was um, here. Um, he would. He was getting, this was probably right after the he and uh, one of our colleagues, one of our supervisors, Dion Drew, did a TED Talk, and you should just Google it, Grayston TED Talk. Um, they did a TED Talk, I want to say it was 2012. And I think that, and we've always gotten this even to this day, if I do something, people just get excited about it because I'm still amazed how many people still don't know about us. But um, at that time, Mike was just getting a lot of calls from people like interested in like, oh, this is great. How do you do it? Uh, how long have you been doing it? And he came up with the idea, and I didn't talk about this in my remarks, but um, he wanted to launch what was then called the Center for Open Hiring here at the foundation where kind of doing what we're doing now, but just a little bit different, um, selling, if you will, you know, fee for service to businesses to learn about open hiring for us to kind of train you. We would do what we would call uh, learning labs. And that's actually how Body Shop got involved. Um, they came to a learning lab and um, two day program where you hear from the bakers, you hear from management, um, you get, do a tour, you get to see it in action. Um, but it was really, started by just a lot of calls coming in about people requesting it and mike had a background in consulting so he thought you know this is something we can not only export but maybe we can get a fee for service for it and that's been the challenging piece but for, for now to me it's a win when we can have somebody not only implementing open hiring but sharing the data and sharing the stories too about the impact that's uh, really important but that's how we got started it was just a bunch of calls coming into the bakery there, maybe just down to the human level, just for um, mm. but who has surprised you the most 
that you've ever recruited or supported someone in recruiting through? Mm, that's a good question there. I haven't gotten that particular question either. It's not so much surprise because again i i begin with the belief and you know the folks you kind of self-select your way into this so you know if you've resolved that you know i don't want the life that i have um, i want to be successful and this is going to be my start if you will um uh, that doesn't surprise me i think what really what I'm still, I ask some of our employees, former and current, this question all the time, which I still can't get my head around, um, and they can't really articulate it either, but what I want to know, and then again, you can Google Dion Drew, or there's another um, documentary that's done on us called Wide Open Dreams that profiles one of our, uh, well, three of our employees, actually, Shauna. Uh, her name is Shauna. Uh, what I want to know is at what point do folks come from these pretty challenging environments um, that it just seems hopeless, but there is something in them that just, they, they push forward. They're just so resilient. Their agency is so strong. And what I really want to know is how do we, what clicked for you? Like, what is that moment? Like, how can we share that feeling or that something that you did that just said you know what i'm going to be better i'm going to do better and you change just like that that's what i want to get my head around and i have a one of our board members um chef jeff henderson he's another one i mean he was in prison for sh selling crack cocaine during the 90s um making lots of money and just suddenly said you know what uh, you know after being you know locked up for a few years i think nine years he's he was like the top chef at Bellagio in Las Vegas. He's now New York Times bestseller author. He's speaking at conferences, you know, getting thirty, fifty thousand dollars a pop. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> like, how do you just change like that and really say, you know, yeah, I could probably make millions selling crack cocaine, but you know, I don't want to do this legitimately. Um, there's something that really clicks in a person's head that I I want to take that and export it to the folks that really need to hear it. So yeah. not so much a surprise, but it's really like, how do we get to that nugget of truth that folks just stumble onto? And because it does, there's something about agency here that, you know, we don't talk a lot about. And I think that's, to me, the key piece. Like, you, I think everybody has it, but some people just realize it just like that. And others, it just takes some time if it happens at all. Yeah, I remember a witty line from a film once that, you know, drug dealers are equal opportunities employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, you can actually readily see how a change of context gives somebody a different opportunity to prove themselves. In it. Absolutely, and, absolutely. Let me just kind of turn the telescope around a little bit and for a moment and th thinking about recruitment and you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I knew about your some of your background. I didn't specifically know you'd held elected office. Yeah, you know, yeah. Time in a more perhaps more predictable world, there was often a sense in government that we, you know we need more business leaders in government. We need more people with a business background to be in. I I wonder with the <coughs> of life today and the range of social issues that inevitably um, come up in economic activity. Um, whether actually we need more people from uh, public service background and backgrounds like that leading businesses. I just wonder if you think that, you know, your background in unelected and elected government positions, is that of, do we need more business leaders with those kinds of backgrounds? You know, uh, how much time do you have? That's a very, <laughs> very good question. So more people from business having a government background as opposed to more the, I think both perspectives are needed. Um, I, when I was at Pepsi, I had a manager from Columbia. He actually worked as an economist or in the ministry of economic ministry at Columbia. And he came, he went into corporate, whereas I started in corporate and went into government. And I, I say I'd rather start in business and go into government as opposed to going in, coming from government and going to business. Cause I think you just have a broader perspective being in business. Um, and you understand really, as my manager used to say, when I even 
left corporate to go into government, he said, you know, don't lose your focus on results, you know, don't use your focus on standards, because government's a totally different beast that just operates in a, the logic is just, or illogic is just very different there. I don't know if we need more government um, business leaders understanding government as opposed to the other way around. I, I really, I, I just don't know if anybody is bold enough to give up uh, business and go into government, particularly, uh, really, no matter what country you're in, nobody wants to go into government right now. Um, but it, it is so desperately needed because it, it does inform your thinking um, and the impact that you have on business. I just don't think a lot of our government officials really understand that, um, whether it's tax policy, whether it's housing policy. And I can say having been a part of implementing that, um, it's you need you need a business mindset there, um, that critical thinking uh, that, again, there's a focus on. And I found this in government, you know, what I might think is a smart business logical decision may not be a smart political <laughs> decision. And I mean, we could talk all day about that. And that's the rub that I always had. And I just, and plus things that I think should take 30 days can take two years in government. I, after a while, you you go crazy <laughs> to be quite honest with you so i don't know uh, if you ask me if i would go into government now i'd probably say no um but i do think both sides need to have a better understanding of the other but i'm not sure if um i i can't see more business people going into government at this point we don't have much time left but um one thing that we haven't gotten into yet is um part of the founding story with bernie that i loved hearing you speak about on podcasts and in other talks is how he got started with ben and jerry's oh that, that's if a good start. i'll tell the quick version i see we're running out of time but um it, it was probably 87 88 1988 uh that um he uh bernie met uh jerry greenfield and ben cohen at a social ventures conference in colorado and they literally went for a walk in the woods to just kind of catch up on each other at that time obviously ben and jerry's were just starting their ice cream business we were making cakes and tarts we had no experience in uh, what they were proposing to Bernie at the time, but the idea was to make a whoopie pie um, where Ben and Jerry's would do the ice cream, the vanilla ice cream in the center, and we would do the kind of cookie um, outer sandwich piece uh, for them. Um, again, we had no experience in this whatsoever, but it, it worked out in the end. Uh, when we made the product, the product looked nice, uh, but when it was shipped to Vermont, it kind of just congealed into kind of a chocolate slab of mess <laughs> that was not a cookie that you could just nicely fit into the ice cream but um, it was just a slab and somebody came up with the idea of well since we can't use it for the sandwich what what happened if we chopped it up and put it in chocolate ice cream and that became chocolate fudge brownie um, the mistake <laughs> that is now probably worth millions or billions to Ben and Jerry's and the number one flavor actually we're in three of their top 10 flavors now so uh, but that's where it all started but uh, we to this day you know we work very closely with Ben and Jerry's Unilever to kind of work on you know quality and things like that because they obviously have more experience given their scale but yeah that's how it all got started. Is, is it Ben who doesn't have a sense of taste and who goes on mouthfeel. And I don't know. They, we were just with them a, a few weeks ago. I did not know this. Yeah, so I think it's Ben. Um, and he, it, it's a connection. It's it's an olfactory thing. So yeah. because of a lack of smell, there's an associated lack of taste. <clears throat> oh, boy. What becomes very important to him is what he calls mouthfeel. <laughs> uh, and that is why... Ben and Jerry's ice cream has so many interesting textures running through it. So it may have been um, uh, the result of mouthfeel that the idea came up of chopping uh, chopping the slab into little bits. And, uh -huh. and here I thought they were just gluttons that just love chunky bits of things in the ice cream. <laughs> So I think we'll all be going and, and talking to colleagues, figuring out where we can start to seed these ideas and, and what organizations we need to push towards you. Um, 
Thank you. And all. we're here to help and support. So please reach out to us in graceton.org. We'd love to engage. So thank you all. And thank you so much, Joe. Thank you.